Hello and welcome. My first guest, and it's the only time I'll be saying that sentence, because it's the first episode, is Mr. Emmett Druding over here. I um, want to thank him for coming on. And right now, um, let's cut to our cocktail of the week and learn how to make this delicious drink, the Tight Rope Walker. All right, Liz. Uh, how you doing, Liz? Hey, guys. I'm doing okay. Hope you're having a fun time over there. So today I'm going to teach you how to make a whiskey cocktail um, in the comfort of your own home. So I'm in my living room wearing a muumuu. Couldn't really get more comfortable than that, really. So bear with me because this cocktail sounds kind of weird, but I promise it's delicious and super easy to make. So you're going to want to start with a glass full of ice and three ounces of your favorite whiskey. So I prefer rye whiskey. You can always use bourbon. Uh, it's just going to be a little bit sweeter. So I'm using Kinsey Rye, which is a nice dry Philly distilled rye whiskey. And you're going to want three ounces of that. All right. And then you're going to want to grab some Peshaw's Bitters. So this has a nice orange thing going on. Uh, you could totally get this at the liquor store. If you can't find this, feel free to use Angostura Bitters. It's still going to be really, really good. So that's one and two. Then you're gonna to wanna to take some maple syrup. Do not use pancake syrup. I promise you it's not gonna be good. It's a spring for the good stuff, even if it's just a little bottle. So one ounce of that. All right. And then we're gonna to top it off with uh, cayenne cleanse kombucha. So this is nice because it adds some bubbles, it adds some spiciness, but nothing too crazy. So we're gonna want three ounces. And then you're just going to finish it off with about half a grapefruit's worth of juice. So in terms of garnish, you're going to want to take an orange. And full disclosure, I'm eating this orange later for a snack, so I just used a mandarin orange. You're going to take a vegetable peeler and kind of work your way around the natural shape of the orange. If you want to go really fancy, you can make a nice long peel. Okay, so there we just have some of the rind. What you're going to do is rim the glass with it to get the oils on the lip. Give it a nice little twist, a squeeze, and drop her in. Okay. So I kind of want to feel like I'm on vacation because I haven't left the house in three months. So I'm going to garnish this bad boy with a umbrella and a flamingo stir. All right. Hope you enjoy. Cheers. Thank you, Liz. I hope you're doing well over there in uh, Elkins Park. Um, all right, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Bell for the delivery man, 
So that song uh, was Space Dust, written by Emma Trudy. Yeah. By me. Um, now, you, you just had a recent release, Tightrope Walker, the, the cocktail. Um, was that song on that record? It was not. Okay. You should know that. I, sh I, should, I should know that. I should know that. This guy played on the record. <laughs> um, but no, we... Um, that was not, but the new record that um, I'm working on right now in the basement, um, it'll be on that one. Okay. But hopefully, you know, the whole plan was before all this was to get together with you guys. So Chris is in my band with a bunch of other great musicians in Philly, and we, um, uh, we were going to get together and uh, do this live at Rittenhouse Soundworks, but... Now things are kind of changing, but we're working our way through it, so, you know, as you heard, we're figuring out ways to play this tune. Well, that actually, we can, brings me to, uh, you know what, I'm going to flip the script here, I'm going to do the last question first, mm -hmm. so, um, how do you think the, the music industry is going to uh, respond and evolve with all this whole new set of rules with the COVID thing? I mean, at least for you. Well, for for uh, for low hanging fruit like myself, um, <laughs> I think that um, I do believe that it's a waiting game to a certain extent. I mean, I think that once it becomes clearer about how they're going to deal with all this stuff, at some point, I mean, I assume that we will be gigging again. I mean, I assume that restaurants. I hope that restaurants will open again. You know, but there's two aspects of the world, you know, there's the, there's the gigging, making, you know, making a living aspect of it, which is a very important part of it. And then there's the other part of it, of the creative part of it, and sharing your work, and, 
you know, trying to be a songwriter, at least for me. Um, and I think that, um, I think the songwriting aspect of it, the, the, the issue with that is just trying to figure out, I don't know if anybody else has had this problem, and I think some people are more uh, diligent about distancing than others, you know. Mm -hmm. But I know for me, it's like I can't get my, my, my band all together in one room where everybody's happy and everybody can be feeling comfortable. And that's... So that's the problem. That's I mean, the problem. I mean, so it's a lot of home recording. So I mean, you know, you know, the short term response for people like us is like working from home and trying to figure out how can we make the best of sort of a lo fi situation, which is interesting, an interesting challenge. And it's something I'm dealing with right now. And there's some benefits to it. You know, it's a very personal experience for the for the for the for the, for the songwriter. Uh-huh. You know, for me, and I think it's also a personal experience for the other performers, you know, if you're like, if I send you something and then you sit with it for however long you need to sit with it, it could be a week, two weeks, a month, whatever. Month and a half. <laughs> I did that. I did that. Yeah, but, I had it for but, a month and a half. So is, so is a lot of people, yeah. you know. You send it out and you sit with it and you really think about it as opposed to like showing up to a fuck, or uh, to a thing. Curse, it's fine. Okay. okay. It, it's, a, it, you, you show up to a fucking thing and you're like, uh, you know, to a studio and you're like, Where, oh, let me see the league shit. Alright, let's get this thing. You know, yeah, I've been working on it for a little while. You know, I knew this was coming up. But now it's like you have all the time in the world um, in some way, you know. And so that's kind of interesting, you know. And, it is. And it I, think, is. I think from my own perspective, like sitting in my basement trying to play piano when I suck at the instrument, um, but tr but forcing myself for like three days to like yeah. try and figure it out to just you know well, it's that, kind of an interesting process because it, it expands your mind in a way you know you're now looking oh, at a different instrument yeah. differently but also you know it's a, it's a collaborative issue which I never really thought about yeah you're in you, so this industry has always been good with figuring out a new way yeah. you know I mean historically it has Absolutely. and so I think now it's just getting people to have the mentality of forgetting how it used to be and know that I'm going to have a piece of fabric between myself and the microphone. I'm going to, you know what I mean? And that, that's a weird mental it's totally weird dynamic. Yeah. And I think also a lot of it is psychological on the performer standpoint, at least for me it is. And yeah. when I, when I hear the recordings, I'm like, Oh, it sounds almost the same. I think the hardest part is rhythm. <clears throat> rhythm. How so? Because when you're okay, specifically for home recording, specifically for home recording, okay, like okay, you're making an album, let's say you're about oh, you're talk, we're talking about okay, uh, yeah, okay. If, if let's say in that case, you know, let's say in that like not not the live stream so much, mm -hmm. which is a whole separate animal, and that's a whole other you something know, that's new for a lot of us. I mean, for that, yeah, yeah. I mean, I struggle with that having horrible sound issues and all this other shit, and like, but to me, the hardest part is like, okay, now everything has to be a click to a click track. Slash, uh, I can't have Miles come in and play drums to my, you know, and create a backing track for all the whole entire band. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do it live and for my next record mm -hmm. personally is I just wanted that live feel. And, like, we did a good job on Tight Rocker, which is the last record, which you should check out. Um, it's on Spotify. It's on Apple Spotify. Music. All the stuff. Yeah. But, and vinyls will be here soon, I hope. Um, and, um... But the thing is, is, you know, getting my, like, like, I can't have Miles there anymore to, like, lay down a beat for me to, like, so I'm, like, literally hearing this thing in my head, and, and, and I don't know about you, but, like, for me, I'm obsessive about things feeling jumpy or jerky, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes when you're trying to catch up to it, or you're trying to match a click track, it gets like that. Maybe that's just me. Maybe it's just something I have to work on, but that's um, it's it's not you. I mean, it's I think it's, it, that's a universal. It's very type. robotic. Yeah, um, you know, because the music can't breathe. I mean, exactly, and it kind of sucks. So in that way, it's like, oh, like that kind of makes me feel like I don't want my entire record to feel that way. Do you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, but but also, you know, as as an artist, it's a document of the time. So if it has that feeling, that Maybe is what's going. You know, that's what's going on at the time. Which 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 which. Again, it changes the intention of what's already been written, right? In a weird way, but all you know that's that's my thing. Is I think about how, you know we're performing artists. Performing artists have always been influenced by what's happening around them. So 
again, it goes back to we need to learn to change to adapt. Right. Because we'll probably adapt before the rest of the world, and they're going to take from us how to move on. That could be a big ego thing, too. I mean, I think it's a completely out. appropriate ego thing. Um, so, so you play guitar. I do. Why guitar? <sighs> well, I played drums for eight years. Oh, okay. I did, I did not know that. I played drums for eight years when I was young. That was because my dad either gave me the option of piano or drums. <laughs> and it wasn't that forceful, but, you know. It was 88 keys rather than, like, six drums. So. I wish I had taken a piano in <laughs> retrospect. But, I, I, no, I don't, I don't actually mean that. Drums is awesome, are awesome. I just, I've been playing piano recently, and I've been having a lot of fun with it. But, um, uh, yeah, I started out as a drummer, and then, um, you know, I think I got to a point where I was hearing music in my head, and um, I needed... You know, I wasn't... There's plenty of drummers who are creative enough to be able to make that music happen and still primarily... That drums be their primary instrument. I think there's plenty of people who are great at mm -hmm. doing that. I am not one of those people. I needed some sort of, you know, melodic instrument to okay. help me with that. So I, 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 I moved on to gu guitar primarily when I was, you know, 12 or 13. And that's, oh, wow, okay. Well, I was a singer in a band in high school for... For a few years, you didn't I play just, anything. No, in the band? I just sang. Okay, I just sang and I wrote the lyrics. Was it a rock band or? It was or a rock band. Okay. It, was, it was a rock band. We did. We released some stuff. We we had some stuff out there. We have a couple good tracks. It was like me and like my best friends. You know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Backers, and it was a lot of fun. And um, but then uh, yeah, then I started taking guitar pretty serious. Or I you know, started playing pretty and started gigging a lot like in junior of high school and to pretty much. My twenties. Okay. Now, so so we already you play drums, you play guitar. You're dabbling in piano. Dabbling is a strong word. <laughs> like I literally started playing piano like two weeks ago, and like I tried because I wanted okay. to play on this one track. Okay. And it, you know, and I just sat there and I was just trying to figure out because it was fun. And I and I love piano. I just love piano. It's such a great instrument. Okay. And I and I've also had people tell me that from a songwriting perspective. It's a really great instrument to use. I know a lot of people, like horn players and, and also guitar players, that they, they write on the piano, which always kind right. of freaked me out, because I'm thinking, like, wow, I don't think I would write something on the trumpet. That's weird. Um, well, I think it has the combination of rhythm and melody. That's a good point. That is, and it's also all, it's, in, it's just in your face. It's a lot... Easier to digest in a lot of ways, and I would say easier in a sense of like the concept of like uh, making maybe some interesting chords. Like if you're gonna make, you know, on guitar, you have to make choices about how you're gonna play something. So if you're gonna play like a jazzy chord, like a nine chord, you're omitting the fit. You know, you gotta omit like you gotta omit things. You know, you, you gotta, it's gotta be an you economical know, totally choice, okay. you know, you have to choose. I mean, I can play ten notes at once on exactly. a piano. Well, that's what I'm that's, saying. That's, it's like, okay. Not, you know, okay. Exactly. Whereas on, on a guitar, you know, you have to make choices. Um, and I think that, and also there's so many different shapes and positions mm -hmm. that, you know, that give you a variety of sound, where on piano, it's a lot easier to, to sort of say, okay, I get it. I'm looking at it, it, it makes sense to me. I think yeah. guitar is like, ugh, it's like a... It's like a ugh, you know what I mean? Like I've tried to I've tried to learn more than once. I can't I can't do guitar, but yeah. This question was so outside of those ones that you already play, and I'm going to include piano in that. Yeah. What instrument would what, what, what if you didn't play guitar or never yeah. played drums, and if you didn't start the piano two weeks ago, what what would you want to play? Like if you, if you were a a ten year old you looking at the choice to be in the school band. Okay, um, saxophone, trumpet, or clarinet. Okay. I really, really like, I really like all those instruments. Okay. Quite a lot. That's interesting. Okay, I like that. I, like I that. really I like, like clarinet. I've always thought clarinet just gives a really, it's a vibe instrument. It is, and it's also, I think it's, it's, it's really underused nowadays, too. I love it. You know, it's one Every of those... Every time I hear it, I'm uh, like, oh, it's so great. <laughs> Freaking love that, you know? Um, so, as a songwriter, mm. um, you know, we both write songs. Yeah. 
Um, I find for myself personally, the music is easier, but lyrics I struggle with, and it's like it's almost like a battle sometimes, years sometimes to, to finish a lyric. Hmm. But then I look around and I know that there's other things. So, so do you have a, a lyric that you did not write, like that exists already, that you wished you did? Like, is there is there that lyric that somebody else wrote that just you wish, like I wish I thought of that. I, I mean, wish you know, yeah, sure. I could look at all the Beatles, you know, or the or Dylan or any of those or okay. I mean, so all you... folk music. I don't really think about it that way personally. I, to me, it's very much my own sort of like okay. So I mean, I think of lyrics <clears throat> in a very uh, you know. I, I studied writing, you know, for a lot of my life. I mean, I went to high school for creative writing, and then I in college I, I minored in short fiction and ah. and. Uh, and the creative writing was my minor in college. Where'd you go to high and, school? Uh, I went to Capo, which was... You did, okay, you know, and college was where? Arts. College was Temple. Okay. So, I mean, I spent a lot of time... I think one of the one of the biggest influences on me for lyrics, especially in... I mean, I've been writing lyrics for a long time, but, like, when I started feeling like I really was getting some good lyric lines was short flash fiction. Really? Flash fiction really helped me. I had a class in college with a guy, great teacher, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he was such a good teacher. And we and I really love admired the guy. He was just he's a great guy. He's actually I think he's a pretty well known creative writer in Philly. Um It's actually funny, the 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 about the bouncer at Fergie's, I don't know if you know this is a famous poet, or at least was at one point. Um, okay. I can't remember his name, and I and I apologize. I should know his name. There's all these. These are like well-known writers in the Philly area, um, but um, I found that that was really helpful for me because I sort of understood. I began. I I shouldn't say understood. I began to read stuff that that was profound in a non-pretentious way, slash incredibly not uh, sounding forceful, and trying to get a balance of capturing a moment without overdoing it or trying to create a a world without being telling too much okay so how to how to tell a story within a line that doesn't feel number one um forceful that it doesn't feel number two that it doesn't feel cliche or silly um something that's really like Oh, wow, there's layers to that. Like, a layers to a line. Wow. Okay. Say, how many... What can I get out of this line? What does this line mean on its own? What does this line mean in the context of the line prior to the line after? You know, I, I think that's something that, that, that fit studying fiction, and short fiction in particular, really helped me with. Well, I mean, um, that's what a song is, really, right? I mean... Yeah. Even the nonfiction songs are still short fiction, because... Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, you can even... And it, 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 I think a lot of people struggle with, like, how to express themselves. I mean, I think the main thing is, like, it's not about, it's about finding your voice, and I know that sounds kind of corny in itself, and sort of defeats the purpose of what I'm saying, but it's like, it's about, like, being completely true about about your vision of the world. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yes, yeah. And it's That's... really hard to, to capture that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think it's hard for a lot of people, and it's not that it's not there, it's just hard for people to do it confidently, and then they're always thinking about other songs, and they're like, oh, I gotta do it like this. And like, uh, hey, so listen, that's, there that's... is an art. There is an art to writing a pop song. Don't get me wrong. Oh, there you is. Know, oh. And I'm not, that's not what I do. I mean, I'm more of a, it's my kind of style. I've seen your course. course. That is not what you do. It's very it's, stylized. Yes. It's not like, you know, and, and that's, and even from a lyrical perspective, it's very stylized. It's not like a song that everybody's gonna put their hand up to and be like, yeah, like, and that's a whole other art, you know, like, oh, Taylor Swift's of the world and that whole thing where you can c kind of create songs that, like, you know, hits. I mean, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to write a hit. I mean, you know, that personally, I don't think that's just kind of what I am. I'm more of like a, it's like a world and you either buy into it or you don't, you know what I mean? Like, which is totally fine for me. I'm, I'm not worried about that. But Well, to me, that means longevity, though. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at a lot of people who are like... And, you know, again, I'm, and I'm not comparing myself to any of these people, but if you think of people like Tom Waits or, like, people who are not, like, you know, they might have certain songs that... Yeah, are, did Tom Waits ever have a hit? So I speak? mean, you did know... Did Leonard Cohen ever have a hit? Yeah, well, 
uh, Hallelujah, you know. Well, his version, no, no, but but, but, yes. but no, but it's but a song. Still, but it's a songwriter. Exactly, yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. I mean is but, that, like exactly. It's like it's a world. Elliot Smith. Oh God, I love Elliot Smith. Yeah, that, yeah. Connor Oberst. I mean, even like people like that. And that Connor Oberst has had some hits, but like, and I like Connor Oberst. I mean, I you know I'm you know ugh, I don't like all of his newer stuff. No offense, Connor. I love you as a, a young man. You're a genius, but the newest <laughs> stuff. I, and, and I should, I, I, you know, there's a lot. Everybody goes through a period. I just now the new stuff does not resonate to me. But the the first few albums are incredible. you heard it here first are incredible. If you're oh. watching this, um, um, but um, I'm also real. You know, I have a strong opinions in general. But um, uh, that's, that's, that's why you're here first. Yeah. That's why you're here first. So okay. So to me, this is just me. I mean, I think lyrics and music, lyrics and chords and harmony are very separate in my head. That's just how I do. I mean, I don't... That's my own thing. So, so sometimes, like, the lyrics I like and really admire, and like, oh, I wish I wrote that, they're in songs that, like, I really don't care for the rest of the song. I'm just like, that's a great lyric, I just don't like the song. Mm. Um, is, the, is there, like, a set of chord progressions or a songwriter that writes harmonies that you're just like, man, that is... That's something else, you know. The, the, the you know the musical version of the last question, because to me it's sure. a separate it's a separate issue with me. But I don't know if you you feel. Uh, that. well, from my own perspective of uh, uh, from a writing perspective, it usually comes sometimes, rarely. I mean, I've had this experience where the where the melody comes first, mm -hmm. and then I'm writing lyrics, and then I go find chords later. I've had that really, really rare, actually. Most of the time, it's a chord progression, or it's a, um, a you know, some sort of progression or guitar okay. part. Now, is, then, is there a writer that you love, though, that, that every time you, you, you know, yourself plays Paul this? Paul Simon. Paul Simon? Okay. Paul Simon. Paul McCartney. Okay. The two Pauls. Um, I think Paul McCartney's a... I mean, you know, I'm just being dead horse here, but I think he's an absolute genius, and I think his, I think he gets a lot of crap for his solo career. Or like, I, I think the Beatles get so much crap. I know that they like, like, because like everybody's like, eh, they're overrated. It's like, no, they're not. Look, go really study their work. They're not overrated, and go study his work because his work is great. Yeah. Go listen to a song called this song off Ram, Monkberry Moon Delight. It's one of the greatest songs ever. I love that song. Monk, Barry, Barry Moon, Moon Delight. Delight. Okay, okay. Go listen to that song. That song is incredible. Um, I he's I not lyrically... Sure now, he's not lyrically moving me in the same way that... Um, a Dylan would, or a John I actually, Lennon. I, I, yeah, I, again, I'm going to upset people. I'm not a big Bob Dylan fan, lyrically or musically. I just don't find him that interesting, personally. Uh, and, and that's actually really, like, s silly to say. I think he's a brilliant musician and a brilliant lyricist. And I'm not trying to, you know, don't get me wrong, this is the critic, this is not the me, con you know, I don't want people no, to think, that's... oh, man, like, no, like, I'm just looking, like, I don't ever put Bob Dylan on in my house unless it's like, you know, it's, there's certain songs I like, you know, like, I like One More Cup of Coffee, it's one of my I was, favorite I, songs. I was going to say, the only, the, I've got a couple Dylan vinyls, Desire's the only one I, I actually listen to, and that whole album love is, Desire. That whole album, yes. I absolutely Isis. I, I just, absolutely love Desire. <laughs> yes, but I find that it's like, to me, from a musical perspective, I get the lyrics thing, but the the presentation of it is so lyrical, but so not musical to me in certain ways. Where I think it's that's like, why I think that's why we like Desire because I think to me Desire so is the most melodic. Yeah, and, and like, it's the violin. Yeah. And the backup singer. And I love that. And whereas, like, I'm trying to think of somebody who I think really captures it for me. Um, I, mean, I, mean, I guess go back to, like, some of the classics. Because the difference, there's a difference between poetry and song. Yes, and that, that's why... You know, and, like, I get it, Bob Dylan's a great poet, but, like, is he a great... Is he is the best songwriter of all time? No. I don't think so at all. You know what I mean? He's got a Paul one McCartney's and a five and a four and maybe a two. I think I think Paul McCartney's a better songwriter than him. I think that... Oh God, I'm starting to throw hard... hard no, hey, right you're fine. I think Elliot Smith's a better songwriter than him. I like... I love Elliot Smith. I'm a huge yeah. Elliot Smith fan. I think he's a genius. I think he's one of the greatest. Um, I think... Um, who else is just fantastic? That I listen to a lot. I mean, I listen to a lot of old music. I mean, I listen to a lot of um, 
you know, old black American music. I mean, you know, really like old old blues. Well, I mean, that's what I love about your sets is when I when I've seen you, you you'll do some originals, you'll do some. I can't really call them covers because you don't hear them anywhere else. But like songs by local songwriters that you don't they nobody's recorded. Sure, you do, and yeah. then you'll pull out some obscure song from nineteen twenty three. Right, I try. I mean, I'm trying and, to like, but 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 it's it's really. It puts you in that that class of people like yeah, there is no genre. Well, th- and that's and those I are mean, my favorite artists. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, mean, I, 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 I have no interest in. I, mean, I, I remember I had a conversation with a songwriter once, and um, he was saying, "Yeah, I really want to make a song." We were trying to collaborate, and he was like, "I really want to make a song that sounds like this." I think it was like Father John Missy or something like that. And he was like, "I really want to make a song that sounds like this." And I'm like, I don't want to make a song that sounds like anything that anybody else has ever done. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm I, not I, interested yeah. in doing it. I know that's a bold take, but I just like, you know, other thing, just to, just an aside about, uh, we were talking about lyrics. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I, so, so old, like, old, like, country blues, like, uh, you know, old, like, true, like, uh, black American music is so mm. influential to me just from a lyrical standpoint, also just from a song, from a songwriting guitar playing standpoint. Oh, but then thanks. also um, old classic country um, as well. So Willie, I mean, I'm a big Willie Nelson fan. I'm a huge I, Willie Nelson oh, fan. Yeah, I, I think he's a genius. I think he's a, one of the best songwriters. I think he's better than Bob Dylan. Um, I think um, I love. You know, and he's I, a great guitar player. He's and, a very and, good guitar. And he doesn't player. get enough credit for that. He does not. And yeah. he's a really great lyricist. And like, man, we should just turn this episode like me. I, I, I Bob. Bob <laughs> I love you, man. I'm sorry. And I'm not trying to be like, you know what's funny? Is there's so many people who are going to be like, there's people who are like so anti Beatles, right? And they're like, the Beatles are corny or like, they're not that good. Like, they're, they're overrated. And now I'm like that with Bob Dylan. I'm like, you know, Bob No, but, but good, it's, you know? but, but you're still showing him respect. You haven't, you haven't said, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that. Bob I mean, Dylan's a, one of the best songwriters of all time. I'm just saying that, like, you know, I think from a, where music and lyrics meet, mm-hmm. He's not like in my register of like one of the like he's not like one of my favorites personally. Yeah, you know. Um, that's interesting. Um, all right, we'll be uh, take a short break. We'll be right back. Ha <laughs> Tonight 
My feet are sore from dancing and my heart is made of wood for you. And we're back. <laughs> All right. So we're here with Emmett Druding, um, recent release Tight Rope Walker, which is available on all streaming services and um, also for purchase and digital download on probably Bandcamp. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Oscar. Um, we've got the zoo. The zoo decided to yeah, join the us crew, for this section. The crew yeah, is yeah. Here. So when did you know? That artistry was your profession and calling. Um, when I uh, did every other job and completely despised it, um, and felt like the only thing I had that was valuable to provide back to humanity was perhaps something that I of, of song that was really the only, you know, or creative, creative energy is the only thing I thought that I could ever do that would be, you know, a value. Okay. I'm not smart. I'm not that smart. I'm not a great scientist. I'm not, you know, my my wonderful wife is a fantastic um, nurse. Okay. I could never do something like that because I'm not. You, you know, couldn't be fa fantastic nurse, no. No, I could not be a health. I'm not like you know. That's not my skill in life. You know, okay. my skill is not to to you know. My 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 skill is to maybe try to have a connectivity with people through the art you, form. And, you know, whatever art form it is. It could be writing or music or Okay. Anything. Do you have a distinct memory of when you realized that this is what it's got to be? Uh, yes. Um, I went to college. I got a degree. Um, I got a degree from Temple University in Communication Studies, which is basically like it's a great program. I should, you know, I'm not dissing them. I, I think it's a fantastic program run by a really, really smart guy, Scott Radson. He's a genius, a really great dude. And it, it is creative. It's a creative field. It can be creative. But it was basically like the, uh, um, you go into like, you know, you analyze uh, crisis, crises in some kind of organization and you tell them what they did wrong from a communication standpoint. And as I was doing, it was kind of interesting, uh, very interesting. But if that didn't get me going, then I knew I was I was fucked, and I was just gonna have to do what you know. I was gonna have to just be a creative for my life, which mm -hmm. you know is what I decided to do, which is good and bad. Well, which is so. So, what do you, what are your thoughts on creativity and talent and creation? I mean, is it something that you would call innate? Does it exist in your life across musical boundaries? Uh, no. It's not innate, or it doesn't exist across music. It does what? not exist. Okay, so I mean, I mean, there was a time where I wanted to be a filmmaker. I mean, I definitely went through a period of writing screenplays and trying to do that. And okay. Writing books and poetry and I mean I've written some poetry books they're not good <laughs> um, you know I think that I mean yeah it, sure it's it's it, I I think creativity is the kind of thing where like you you look at the world in a certain way and like 
I don't know, for me it's like, what can I provide that that is relevant to like the greater world or like what, okay. what is my contribution in a sense that like, okay, there's two things. What's my contribution and what makes me feel like I'm comfortable? You know? Interesting. And being, I know that working for other people doesn't make me comfortable. Makes me feel uncomfortable. So do you, do you, because I've, I've talked to some other performers and, and some, and some of the best ones say, I will never be a band leader. You choose to be a band leader. Regrettably. <laughs> I, I'm Sorry, not, boss. I'm not yes. the best, I'm not the best band leader. I, I mean, I, it's something I have to get used to. I think it's a, that's an art in itself. Being a band leader it's, it's is not, hard. It's not music focused. It really isn't. No, it's not. Uh, that's a whole different thing. Um, and you have to be very demanding. I, I think that's something that I have to work on in general. And that's more of like, and actually that's very similar to like running a business. You know, it's very, it's very much, you gotta, the hard things are hard and saying, I mean, listen, I've had to cut people out I've, and I've done it in That's ways, hard. I've done in ways that didn't feel as hard as maybe it, I thought it was going to be, you know, saying, oh. Hey, well, this person isn't fitting and how am I going to figure out how to sort of step away? You know, oh, I did, yeah. as opposed to, I've never been, I've never fired somebody, but I also never thought that I, I had the right to do that. Well, I never lucky. thought I was at a level where I was able to do that, you know. So I'm also there's a lot of uh, you know self hate involved in this too. <laughs> Who's somebody that you think deserves wider recognition? All right, well I'm I gonna, love local, but you don't have to go local. I'm gonna go local just because it's somebody. Well, I have two people. My father is one of them. Um, no I, will, I will, and and that's because. Um, it's just true, and even though he's my old man, and he was one of the great guitar players of his generation, and I believe that as a comp and from a composition compositional perspective. I was as an improviser. I will say that I yeah. as um, an improv as a as a guitar player as a um, as a, uh, a from a composition perspective um, for instrumental guitar music. I mean. He's right up there with John Fahey, Leo Kaki. I mean, mm -hmm. and, I, and different, very different though. Very jazzy, very much different, you know, in his own world. He, he had a very unique sound, and, and I know he was, he was put in the jazz vein, which, it, which is almost like a curse sometimes. Yeah. I um, mean, because he, he... He wasn't jazz, I mean... But he was, he was very impro improvisation-based. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, if we're using the term in that sense, absolutely. Yeah, but because that, I absolutely. think that's what the general public is going to think, you know. You, yeah, you, yeah. To, to me, I mean, he, he was based in a... You can't, you can't even say black American music. You, you, I mean, he was world music. I mean, he, he was... I agree. Yeah, obsessed totally. with the harmonies of other cultures. Um, yeah. Now, quick story. I think you've heard this. You haven't. Um, your father, Richard, asked if he could come sit in for a song or two with, with my band. And I said, sure. And he, he put his chair up in front of my piano, and he sat there with legs crossed, guitar. And I said, do you want a music stand? Do you want to, I, have to, I brought a book of charts of all of my songs. So you can, he goes, nah, I don't, I don't need that. I'll, I'll be fine. <laughs> and he played the entire night. He didn't just sit in. He played all three sets with the band. That's insane. And he didn't miss a beat. Yeah, and I'm sitting, and then like, I, all he got was the key. And I'm like, okay, this song, and like, oh, he's like, oh, I'm good. I'm, and, and he... That's insane. I mean, that is insane, yeah. And that's when I realized, I'm like, like, this man, I mean, I've admired him for a few years, but like, this man is something special. Do you remember what year that was in? Just from interest. I mean, um, I'm trying to, so for, from band that. members, yes, I can figure this out. I would say probably 2014, 2015. That makes sense. That makes sense. Probably. Before you got sick, that's what I would say. Okay. Okay. Because he got sick, and, and, and to me, there was a noticeable change. Um, not from, like, you know, a heady perspective, just, like, you, you know, it really affected him as a player. Okay. Oh. Um, and when, when was that around, do you think? 20, end of 2015, into 2016. Okay. Fast okay. decline, it was a fast decline. Oh. But he, um, 
Oh man, he was just. I mean, just. I'm telling you, you listen to Wissahickon, listen to uh, that song Insomniac's cool. Lullaby. That that oh. album, Insomniac's Lullaby, is his first. Is his? I uh, know his first album is called The Last Wound Up. It's an amazing album. Tom Gall is on it as well. Are all these albums movies. available on streaming? And all and of them except for The Last Wound Up is not. All of them are available on streaming. His last record was Smoke with Jim Hamilton. Okay, uh, I Jim actually... O'Connor was the percussion player on the Subterranean, and then on Wissahick and, and um, Insomniac's Lullaby. It's um, uh, it's uh, I'm blanking on the name right now. It's uh, Steve. Uh, oh my god, it's okay. He's a genius, but he's a great percussion yeah. player. But he's and he owns. Uh, a drum, a pro drum out in, uh, what the frick is his name? I'm too drunk to remember his name. But it's okay, that's the point of these cocktails. Yeah. So, again, we're, we're, we're drinking, we're drinking Liz, Steve uh, Ferraro. Steve Ferraro, who I freaking love. Steve Ferraro. I just want everyone to remember that. Um, these, these are the, the tightrope walker cocktail, the, um, we're gonna put the, uh, recipe up on the screen just right about now. Here you go, boom, boom, boom. Okay, so you said there was, there was two people. Deserving wider recognition. We talked about Richard. So, Who's the other well, one? Man, what else you got? What Tom you got? Gow. Tom. Oh. Tom Gala is... Yeah, educate educate the people. I think Tom Gala is one of the greatest songwriters um, of his style of music probably in the world. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's an absolute genius. And, and he alive. lives here, too. Oh, yeah. He's alive and well. And I'm actually working on a tribute album uh, with Mike McNichol and um, oh. some other musicians. You're also on their records. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I think Tom is... So Tom and my dad made some incredible records. He also made great records with a lot of other great guitar players. Um, after uh, him and my dad stopped performing together at some point, and then they, he moved on with Ray Duffy, who was another guy oh. who died. He was a great guitar player. Ray Duffy was wonderful, yes. Great guitar yeah, player. Yeah. And... Um, I know he's worked with other other folks as well, but Tom is a um, truly a, one of the one of the most brilliant. If you want to talk about like what we were talking about earlier about lyrics, non pretentious, telling stories in a line. Um, oh, Tom is a master of that, and he could. He's a master storyteller, and he is not a. Um, he doesn't play a specific instrument other than he's one of the only people I could say he is a voice percussion musician. He plays sticks on his knees and he sings. And then musicians line up to play with the guy because he's such a brilliant <laughs> lyricist and a, and, and a melodic singer. He's a great singer. That's But his lyrics are... Um, I mean, they just they, they just they just mess you up. I mean, his, his, oh, yeah. his yeah. lyrics break you down. I mean, like, and they tell stories about his life and about and you know. So the concept of one of the, one of the greatest recordings I believe in folk music history that needs to be and one of the reasons I'm working on this project. I think it's one of the greatest folk records of all time. Period. Okay. It's one of the best things ever. It's him and my dad. They played in this. It's it, they played at this. It's a live recording of them playing in this club in Massachusetts in the 80s. And Tom had this uh, concept called the diner. And the diner is, it's about, it basically kind of goes through a day of the diner. And okay. there's these characters that pop up in the diner. And they represent different things in his life. And you wouldn't know that if you listen to it, but if you know Tom... You know, and you know the stories about Tom. You you begin to see the characters arriving. You know, like certain people, wow. and you know I don't want to speak for him, but out of context. But like, you you understand that he's got a world in this diner, and it, it exists in a day. Mm -hmm. And my dad and him collaborated and made this album. Like my dad constructed the music. I'm assuming all you know, the guitar. I know you just. I know he made all the guitar parts and made and he wrote bass lines. And Tom wrote all the lyrics and all the melodies, the vocal melodies. And they met and they created this concept called the diner. You know, like, there's a one song uh, called about a Ticonderoga pencil. Okay. And, you know, like, and, it, and he introduces it. Like, you know, he's sitting there, he's, he's at the, the bar, he's writing with this pencil. 
And he's like, yeah, I always use these pencils. And then, ding, do, 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 and they're singing songs about pencils. And they're singing songs about the ladies in the booth. And they're singing songs. It's absolutely brilliant. And it's, it, it, it's Americana, but it's also not that simple. It's so much more deep than that. And, I mean, there's very personal moments on that record as well that I know are about Tom and his personal life. You know, there's a man shouting, they call a song called Man Shouting in the Night. That is about a man shouting in the alleyway, he's a drunk. And I know, you know, that Tom has a personal relationship in his life that that was a reference to. And oh, that's it's funny. a beautiful song. I mean, and, and all this work is beautiful. And Tom is just, Tom is just... Now, is, is he on the record? On, on the tribute album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, I'm just, I'm just he's curious. He's from a distance, because I think, I think he's, intru- he's more interested, and I get it. He's more interested in seeing what we do with it, which I think is really cool. Yeah, I mean, I and mean he's like standing back, which I think is really appropriate. But also. I don't think any true songwriter would feel that way. Like, like, oh yeah, he's like, totally like, like. He's also really excited to see, you know, you know. I think young people get involved, and he's the kind of person like. I mean, people should be. There are people who cover his songs all over the world. I mean, which yes. Hazel, which Hazel? Oh, that cover. is one of the most beautiful songs ever. ever. And it's been. And that's one we were supposed to do today, and I forgot to do it. But oh, screw it, it's all good. Um, he is. He just is a beautiful. You know, he's just such a great songwriter. You know. You know, he, and he's also a. You know, well, you've already mentioned the decent human being he is. He's such um, a good guy, man. And he's also, also a very nice man. I, I I never met him before, and I was walking my dog in Mount Airy, and he came across the street. And introduced himself because he knew who you were. Well, he mentioned you. It was right after you and I started working together. Yeah, and and something and and, and it, it was a beautiful, you know, just mm-hmm. just like you you, you kismet, I guess. You know, like it, it, it was it was a meeting of the minds. Yeah, stroke of genius, right there, man. It, it, it was beautiful, and like and like he did not have to go out of his way to oh, come yeah. say hello, he's, and he did. He's outrageously brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I I I. I when I sit with that guy, I, I'm always just like, oh my god, I'm wa-. you know, like I'm like, holy shit, this guy's really fucking incredible. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, I know. Uh, so handicap, I'm gonna handicap you here. Yeah. Okay. You you can't you cannot use the Beatles as the answer or any member of the Beatles. That's fine. Okay. Living or dead, who would you want to cr- collaborate with musically? Of all time, I mean, we can go back to oh, living or dead, living or dead. Um, who would you want? Who, who, who just, just, just for your own poops and laughter, which is my way of saying shits and giggles. But yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great fucking question, and I think no, the Beatles wouldn't even be on that. Um, oh, really? Okay. No, no, not at all. Um, oh, you know. Um, you know who I really think would be fun to make a record with would be uh, Taj Mahal. There you go. I could see that, too. Yeah. I love him. I'm a huge fan. He's, he, he's a genius. He's great. Have you heard the, the new one, him and Ked Mahal? Have you heard that one? Yeah, yeah. It's, he's That's amazing. A... I love Taj Mahal. I think he's so great. Um, there you go. I, I, I love and that I, answer. He's so, and, That's he's so, and he's so weird in that I know that he probably gets shit, you know, from his world. You know, of like, yeah, you're not this way, you're not that way. He's so genreless. You know, yeah, I was just, yes, I was. But, and that's why the I love best about people him. are. I mean, I mean, he's so good, and he gets he doesn't get nearly enough credit. I should put him on the list too. Yeah, he doesn't get enough credit. Taj Mahal is amazing. I think it's the people that refuse to be in a genre. Yeah, are gonna let. They're he the is ones. Genreless, man. Yeah, yeah, they're the ones that you know when 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 the aliens land here in three hundred years or four hundred years or a thousand years, they're we're all like, gone. Oh. And they find these tapes. I mean, already I know the fact that you know. I think I think at that point, Stevie Wonder, they're gonna be like, okay, what is this? Right. This is this is interesting. Mm-hmm. But also, it's the genre. I mean, I think Van Morrison is in that category. Oh, absolutely. I think um, 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 the, the the vocalist Cassandra Wilson oh, is in that my category. God. It's it's like what are you, are you country? Are you jazz? Are you swing? Are you she like, is like what's amazing. going on? Oh man, um, she's amazing, man. Um, um, she did that uh, True Detective intro. Oh, her version of uh, of uh, Sun House is uh, yes. Oh my God, um, what is that? Um, the kill. Uh, 
the Killing uh, Killing Fields. No. no, Killing Floor or like the. Um, I know what you're talking about. I you know what I'm talking about. Um, 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 you know, but she is. She is. I saw her. It was my first jazz fest living in New Orleans. I was I was 18 years old, and it was her Miles Davis tribute record had come out, which is nothing like Miles Davis. Like it was it was totally nothing. It was, it was crazy. So what did you do? Sprite lyrics to Miles' tunes? Well, some existed already. Others, others she added, and then she had a couple of originals on there. But her band, it was, it was just, it, it, it was life changing. It was. She's, she's, she's amazing, insane. amazing. Probably. Yeah, I love her. I love her so. One much. of the few people who's not a singer. My dad put, she's, put me on her. Oh yeah. Oh, of course he would. Yeah. I, I'm not surprised. And I remember always being like, I always remember her. Because now I'm just always being like, oh, what a sound, you know, like, oh, it's, holy fuck. Anytime like, she has something new, I'm just like, okay, that's, that's really, but check out, it's called Traveling Miles. It's her, it's, it's her record. It's very acoustic, like acoustic guitar instead of electric, upright bass, um, right. marimba and vibraphone. Oh my God. Oh, it's, 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 it's Stefan Harris is on it, uh, Eric Lewis, Dave Holland on bass, uh, it, great record. Okay, yeah. so. All right, oh, here it is. This is my favorite. This is the one I'm waiting for. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the worst gig you've ever had. Oh, well, that's the funny. worst. The worst gig you've. That's easy. That's so easy. Um. So I was playing when I was in my early twenties. I played a lot of house shows, and it was kind of a. You don't mean house the genre. You mean. No, I mean like yes. I, I mean like playing in somebody's basement or like I'm for a joke, but yes, yes, <laughs> for like you know fucking like temple parties or some shit. Okay, you know, and you're like the, and I was sort of the, I think people looked at me as a. I mean, I wasn't good, um, but I was interesting. You know, I played cocaine blues. You know. Like, fucking standards and shit, but horribly. And people would be like, wow, this is crazy. But I'd be screaming them in, like, a punk way. And people would be like, whoa, this is... <laughs> I think people watch me as sort of like... I can a... just hear making Whoopi done that way. And in my yeah. head, I'm just like, this is... Make you Whoopi! You know, like, <laughs> and I'm in the fucking box. You know, people, it's like, it's like people, like, watching me in the box. And they're like, wow, this is, like, fucking weird, you know? Um, but, and I think that was a lot of it. But I remember, um... It was me. I had a band at the time. Great guys. I still play with all these guys. Um, Harry Metz, Alex Drust, um, Ray Bailey. Oh, I know Alex. Yeah, Ray. You know Ray, and you know and oh Ray, I, I love Ray. Yeah, and you know I love um, you, Alex too. Yeah. And you know, and you know, you don't. You might not know Harry, but Harry's a great musician. One, one God, thank great uh, producer, great drummer. Really? Okay. Oh, he's great, Harry. He's actually Ray's cousin. Um, I've worked with all their family. I met his parents. parents. Yeah, I worked yes. with their entire family at, at okay. some point. The, the Matt says, anyway, we had, we had this gig, and um, um, somebody in the band brought a bottle of, uh, or I should say a handle of Jameson, and we were on last. <laughs> we were on last, and uh, we didn't find out we were on last until we started drinking, and that was a huge mistake. And um, Because all you could do is keep drinking. Continue to drink hard, <laughs> hard liquor. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, that's, we're, uh, that's we're about half a handle done um, between the four of us, and I think I drank a lion's share of that. And I sit down, or I, I get my guitar, I put the strap on, I'm ready to go, and I suddenly don't remember how to play the guitar anymore. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I'm in front of, and we're talking about a crowd of like. Probably eighty to eighty people in a living room. I mean, it was a big house. That was that's a good crowd for a house party. It's a huge crowd. Yeah, 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 yeah. massive crowd. Yeah. So we're sitting there, and people on the stairs waiting. They're like, "Oh my god, yeah, we're ready." And I'm like, I don't remember anything how to play, you know. And so we're playing. Ray hasn't had a drink, by the way. So Ray was very, you know, Ray's like sitting there, being like, "Are right, you guys ready?" And he's like, "You guys are fucking ready." And he goes, "What the fuck this up?" And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I remember, let me just get a stool. And I remember, like, going to the crowd and being like, I, I gotta sit down. And I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the guitar, I'm like, I'm like, all right, let's do it. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm like, and then, you know, I'm like, three chords in, I'm like, I can't fucking remember how to play anything. And so Ray's like, fucking look, I remember Ray's looking at me, he's like, you fucking 
fucking asshole. You know what I mean? Like, you, like, you fucking piece of shit. And, and, and me and Alex are hammered. And Harry's like, what the fuck? And we're like, Ugh. and everybody's like, oh, boo, this is terrible. You know, we're getting booed. We get, oh, we were awful. I mean, we were awful. You know, and, and, and we, got through, we, barely, we didn't get through four songs. We restarted four songs. And then I started screaming at this guy in the front row. He was right there. What was, was he like, doing? What was he doing? He was like, mm, he was giving the shit. And I was like, go fuck yourself. You know, I remember taking the guitar off. I was like, fuck you. And like, I remember getting dragged out of there by like my friends. Because I had my friends there. And they're dragging me out of the gig. And I'm like, fuck all of you. You know, like, <laughs> Dude, but the silver line of the story, it's funny, is the guitar that I had, which is a very nice guitar. I left there. I left. It's <laughs> a good side of the story, apparently. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. Well, it's actually it's not it's actually a sad it's a sad oh. silver line, but it's sort of funny. And I left this nice guitar there, and I and I and I two and a half years later, I messaged the girl who owned the house, and I said, "Hey, do you still have that guitar?" <laughs> 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 so, yeah, sorry, dude. We sold that shit. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I don't blame you. I'm sorry for fucking even showing up to that gig. That was the worst gig experience I've ever had. Now I've had that worst professional, like real fucking gigs. No, that's the answer I was looking for. Is what you said. Yeah, that, that was, was good. That was good. I've had I've had worse, you know. But that was like my lowest of lows as a live performer. How old were you? How long? How, how long? I was probably this? like 21, 22. All right. Um, that's funny. Um, yeah, we're gonna take a short break. We'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> That was sad, though. That was really sad. Some people never find themselves, let alone someone like you. Oh, so when I met you, oh, I knew it was special, I knew that it was love. A song for you.
days of blooming in the garden. Bright yellow flowers in the middle of winter time. And I tell my heart, be strong. Take myself along to a place I know in the winter. Look at that south sloping bank covered with ice. And I tell my heart it all melted and went down to the ocean. And you will not be injured by this dark and troubled time. for the cocktail recipe, which has been keeping us... <laughs> Thank you. This is good. All right, so, uh... <laughs> I got some, um, some jokes for you to read. If you can, um... Yeah, pass them over. Read them to the camera? Sure. Here you go. I'll do that. Did you hear that food scientists have finally managed to remove the mint flavor from gum? The experiment was a complete success. <laughs> Why did the Norwegians put barcodes on the sides of their ships? So when the come into port, they can Scandinavian. <laughs> After an extremely tense argument with my girlfriend, the house was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Things got a lot worse when I saw the grenade flying towards me. <laughs> Emmett hates me right now. He he really he really he hates every minute of this. Um, okay, these these are my favorite. These last two are my favorite. A man walks in a bar and shouts, "Free beers outside!" So everyone in the bar, except the bartender, ran outside in excitement. The bartender, visibly angry, yells at the man, "What the hell did you do that for?" Now I have no customers! The man says, sorry, mister. I honestly didn't think any of those men would be brave enough to fight a grizzly beer, let alone three of them. <laughs> that would be good. Um, <laughs> this, is, this, this one's my favorite. I'm gonna tag Miles in this shit. Um, this is my favorite. 
When does Donald Trump think people take Xanax? For Hispanic attacks. Ah! All right. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, <laughs> thank you for humoring me. <laughs> I enjoy it. That was some jokes. Emma Druding, everybody. Um, Emma Druding, tight rope walker is on the Spotify and the Apple Music. Please stream it. Buy a copy. Oh, fucking force yourself to listen to it. Stream. <laughs> fucking do whatever it takes. Just, just, just please, do whatever please. it takes. We, 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 we have not had a, you know, it's a whole thing or the COVID, you know, just, just stream as much music as you can. We will have Donate. Soon. Um, so the famous, uh, 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 French interviewer, Bernard Pavot, had a series of questions that was adapted by, uh, James Lipton for the Inside the Actors Studio. And I just love those ten questions. So here we are. So, so... No long answers here, sir. Okay? Understood. What is your favorite word? Fuck. Yeah, that's really cliche. What is your least favorite word? Why? Good. Okay. What turns you on? Uh, anger. What turns you off? Simplicity. What sound or noise do you love? Pop. Pop. What's pop? Pop. Okay. Okay. What sound or noise do you hate? Lawn mowers. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, what's your favorite curse word? Um, shit. Okay. Um, what profession other than your own would you want to attempt? Baseball player. Oh. What profession would you never want to attempt? CEO. And finally, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you enter the pearly gates? You did a good job. Now you can hang out with your wife in the national parks for the rest of your life. Ladies and gentlemen, Emmett Druding, thank you very much for watching. Um, we're only here because of you. Thank you.